heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline hides off. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up this hour, we bring you live comments from former President Trump as he prepares to speak on his guilty verdict. Plus, we'll hone in on tech earnings and break down results from Dell as shares sink after the report. And we speak with EU Commissioner Vera Jourova to talk social media, elections and misinformation. Uh, we are awaiting live comments from former President Donald Trump after he was found guilty in the first criminal trial of a former U.S. president in U.S. history. For more, let's go to Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Horden in New York City and David Gura, who's actually outside of Trump Tower, where Trump is set to speak at any moment. David, we start with you. Uh, former President Trump uh, has already given comments. He's made his position on the outcome of the trial known. W what do we expect to come later? Yeah, we got brief comments yesterday after that verdict was rendered. The former president came downstairs in the courtroom in Lower Manhattan and decried the proceedings and criticized the judge for what had happened and uh, looked ahead to November 5th to the general election. He said that's when the final verdict will be rendered. I expect that in just a few minutes' time we're going to hear something similar, a variation on that theme from the former president. Uh, we're looking for two things. We're looking for some insight into his temperament, how he has reacted to this astonishing verdict, this historic verdict yesterday. Also looking at sort of what he has to say about the path forward for him. There are a couple of key dates now that lie ahead. The first, July the 11th, that's when he's scheduled to be sentenced again here in Manhattan by Judge Juan Rushan uh, after that verdict was reached yesterday. Uh, then, of course, November 5th, that is the general election in the United States. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that just a couple of days after that sentencing date is the Republican National Convention. There's a debate just before them. So this is a busy calendar, busy political calendar that is sort of interwoven with the legal calendar. And aside from temperament, what happens with those dates? We want some indication of how this appeals process is going to go. President, former President Trump's lawyer was on television last night talking about their intent to appeal. What's the timeline for that going to be? How is that going to dovetail uh, with the, the sentencing memoranda that are going to be filed as well? So, Ed, paying attention to all of that, hoping to get some insight here uh, from Donald Trump when he makes his way to the atrium of the building behind me in just a few minutes' time. Uh, AMH, the political story, and if there is one thing that President Biden and former President Trump agree on, I think it's that November 5th is where real decisions will be made. Absolutely. That was the message from both those men yesterday evening when they used this verdict to really go out and say their side of the story and try to campaign off of it. That is what Joe Biden's campaign tweeted, as well as that's what the former president said yesterday. And to David's point, I imagine he's going to make that same pitch again today. And they're both campaigning off of this because this does matter for November 5th, because right now, Ed, when you look at the polling that was done ahead of this verdict, it's very muddy in terms of it's a mixed bag. It feels like a fickle electorate. I want to bring you two polls. PBS NewsHour NPR Maris poll said 60% 67% of voters said a conviction would make no difference to who they decide to cast a vote for on November 5th. Very key to that, more than 70% of those individuals were independents. Biden will bring his base. Trump will bring his base. They have to fight for the people that are on the fence and unsure of who they're going to vote for, especially in the swing states. But then ahead of that verdict, we also had a survey from Marquette Law School, and they said that a guilty verdict would produce a four-point lead for Biden head-to-head -head in national polls, while while a not guilty verdict would have resulted in a six point Trump lead. Time is only going to tell what message is going to land with the electorate between now and November 5th. Bloomberg's Amory Horden and David Gura, thank you. We'll get back to both of you later in the hour. And as you can see the podium and live shot up, we will bring you former President Donald Trump's comments as they begin. I want to talk a little bit about markets. In the markets, one of the main driving factors was PCE and um, a growing sense particularly reflected in the bond market that the Fed will have room to cut rates uh, 
as its preferred measure of inflation shows some easing, although equities, which got off on a kind of stronger footing at the open, uh, are a little softer. The S&P 500, the, the sort of benchmark index down a half a percentage point. We also continue to reflect on uh, former President Donald Trump's uh, guilty verdict. Trump Media and Technology Group off session lows down 3.8 percent. There was a much more profound move lower in after hours trading last night. Um, it actually opened higher. It's down lower. We use it as a proxy for sentiment and we track that stock uh, based on the market's interpretation of what is happening with President Trump. Uh, also important is the earnings story and that is Dell. Dell is down 21 percent. Uh, extremely high expectations. This is a stock that was soaring and investors were believing the AI story in particularly Dell's server business. But those high expectations weren't met, even though we saw the first quarterly revenue growth in quite some time. Let's go to Bloomberg's Brody Ford. Brody, I think that kind of sums it up. This was a company that was doing well. The stock was riding high. Expectations were high and they didn't meet those off the expectations. Yeah, being down 21% sounds bad until you remember that they were up 130% through. I mean, this is a stock that's outperformed NVIDIA this year because everybody remembered that, wait, hold up, Dell makes more than computers. They make servers. They make high-powered servers. If you want to train AI models and inference them, you need these AI servers. And so they've really vaulted over the last year as they've seen their orders for these AI-oriented servers go Brady. from about zero until up about three billion, right? Um, uh, and so it, case where it was- Brady, Bloomberg's Brady Ford. Street. President Trump Anyone. is speaking in New York City. Bad people. These are, in many cases, I believe, sick people. When you look at our country, what's happening where millions and millions of people are flowing in from all parts of the world, not just South America, from Africa, from Asia, from the Middle East, and they're coming in from jails and prisons, and they're coming in from mental institutions and insane asylums. They're coming in from all over the world into our country. And we have a president and a group of fascists that don't want to do anything about it because they could right now, today, he could stop it. But he's not. They're destroying our country. Our country is in very bad shape. And they're very much against me saying these things. Uh, they want to raise your taxes by four times. They want to stop you from having cars with their ridiculous mandates that make it impossible for you to get a car or afford a car, but make it very possible for China to build all of our cars. It's a very serious problem that we have. We just uh, went through one of many experiences where we had a conflicted judge, highly conflicted, there's never been a more conflicted judge. Now, I'm under a gag order, which nobody's ever been under. No presidential candidate's ever been under a gag order before. I'm under a gag order, nasty gag order, where I've had to pay thousands of dollars in penalties and fines and was threatened with jail. Think of it. I'm the leading candidate. I'm leading Biden by a lot, and I'm leading the Republicans to the point where that's over. So I'm the leading person for president, and I'm under a gag order by a man that can't put two sentences together, given by a court. And they are in total conjunction with the White House and the DOJ, just so you understand. This is all done by Biden and his people. And maybe his people, more importantly. I don't know if Biden knows too much about it, because I don't know if he knows about anything. But he's nevertheless the president, so we have to use his name. And this is done by... Washington, and nobody's ever seen anything like it. So we have a judge who's highly conflicted. You know what the confliction is. Nobody, nobody wants to write about it, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. If I do, he said, I get put in jail. So we'll play that game a little bit longer. We won't talk about it, but you're allowed to talk about it. I hope you do, because there's never been anybody so conflicted as this. As far as the trial itself, it was very unfair. We weren't allowed to, allowed to use our election expert under any circumstances. Uh, you saw what happened to some of the witnesses that were on our side. They were literally crucified by this man who looks like an angel, but he's really a devil. He looks so nice and soft. 
People say, oh, he seems like such a nice man. No, unless you saw him in action. And you saw that with a certain witness that went through hell. And when we wanted to do things, he wouldn't let him, he wouldn't let us do those things. But when the government wanted something, they got everything. They got everything they wanted. It's a rigged, it was a rigged trial. We wanted a venue change where we could have a fair trial. We didn't get it. We wanted a judge change. We wanted a judge that wasn't conflicted. And obviously he didn't do that. Uh, there's, nobody's ever seen anything like it. We had a DA who was a failed DA. Crime is rampant in New York, violent crime. That's what he's really supposed to be looking at. Crime is rampant in New York. Yesterday in McDonald's, you had a man hitting him up with, with uh, machetes, a machete. Whoever can imagine even a machete being wielded in a store, in a place where they're eating and he's going rampant and Bragg is down watching a trial on what they call uh, crimes, crimes. They're falsifying business records. That sounds so bad. To me, it sounds very bad. You know, it's only a misdemeanor, but to me, it sounds so bad. When they say falsifying business, that's a bad thing for me. I've never had that before. I'm falsifying. You know what falsifying business records is? In the first degree. They say falsifying business records. Sounds so good, right? It means that legal expense, I paid a lawyer, totally legal. I paid a lawyer a legal expense. And a bookkeeper, without any knowledge from me, correctly marked it down in the books. A very professional woman, highly respected, she testified. Marked it down in the books as a legal expense. So a legal expense, paid a lawyer, is a legal expense in the books. It's not a sheetrock construction or any other thing. It's a legal expense. Think of that. This is what the falsification of business records were. And I said, what else are you going to call it? What else are you going to call it? Now, I would have testified. I wanted to testify. The theory is you never testify, because as soon as you testify, anybody. If it were George Washington, don't testify, because they'll get you on something that you said slightly wrong, and then they sue you for perjury. But I didn't care about that. I wanted to. But the judge allowed them to go into everything that I was ever involved in, not this case, everything that I was ever involved in, which is a first. In other words, you could go into every single thing that I ever did. Was he a bad boy here? Was he a bad boy there? And my lawyer said, what do you need to go through? And all you wanted to do is testify simply on this case, because I would have loved to have testified. To this day, I would have liked to have testified. But you would have been you would have said something out of whack, like it was a beautiful sunny day and it was actually raining out. And I very much appreciate the big crowd of people outside. That's incredible what's happening. The level of support has been incredible. So the whole thing is legal expense was marked down as legal expense. Think of it. This is, my, this is the crime that I committed that I'm supposed to go to jail for 187 years for when you have violent crime all over this city at levels that nobody's ever seen before, where you have businesses leaving, and businesses are leaving because of this, because heads of businesses say, man, we don't want to get involved with that. I could go through the books of any business person in this city, and I could find things that, in theory, I guess, let's indict him, let's destroy his life. But I'm out there, and I don't mind being out there, because I'm doing something for this country, and I'm doing something for our Constitution. It's very important, far beyond me. And this can't be allowed to happen to other presidents. It should never be allowed to happen in the future. But this is far beyond me. This is bigger than Trump. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than my presidency. And the people understand it, because I just see a poll just came out, the Daily Mail. That was the first one, came out, it was done last night right after the verdict, where I'm up six points. Six points from what we already were. We were leading fairly, fairly substantially. We're up six points in the Daily Mail poll. Now, maybe other polls come out and says something differently. But a lot of people have predicted it because the public understands and they understand what's, what's going on. This is a scam. 
There's a rigged trial. It shouldn't have been in that venue. We shouldn't have had that judge. He should have allowed, allowed us to have an election expert. We had the best expert, most respected expert, head of the Federal Elections Commission. He was all set to testify. He was waiting for two days. And when it was his turn, Bragg's people protested. And the judge knocked him out, said, you can't testify. He actually said, you can't testify to, for anything having to do with the trial. You can say what the federal elections is. Well, that doesn't help. Everybody knows that. But you can't testify. So essentially, he wasn't able to testify. Other people weren't able to testify. But with these people, they were able to use people salacious. By the way, and nothing ever happened. There was no anything. Nothing ever happened, and they know it. But they were as salacious as they could be. And it had nothing to do with the case. But it had to do with politics. And do you notice the timing? The timing was perfect. This case was dead. It was dropped by every agency, every governmental board. It was dropped by the highly respected Southern District. They said, no, there's no case here. It was dropped by federal election. And that's what it's about. This is about a federal election, not a state election. You're not even allowed to look at it. They took the state and the city, and they went into a federal election. They're not allowed. The people from federal election, Southern District, and Washington dropped the case. Everybody dropped the case. There was no case. Cy Vance dropped the case. And when Bragg came in, he said, this is the most ridiculous case I've ever seen. And who would have a certain person, again, gag order, who would have a certain person like this ever testify? He said, this is essentially one of the worst people I've ever seen ever to testify. He said, the craziest case I've ever seen, this is Bragg. Then when I announced I was running for president, long time later, they decided to revive this case. And they got a judge, Judge Marshan, who was responsible for another case that was also brought. It destroyed the life of a very good man, by the way. Destroyed the life of a very good man who went to prison once. And then they just put him in prison again because they said he, he lied. He didn't lie. I looked at the statements he made. In fact, he didn't remember something, and they put him in jail again. They've destroyed him with me for many years. He was an honorable person. He was an honest man. And if you look at what he did, supposedly, it never happened. There's never been anything like this over the education of his grandchildren. Over, he didn't report that he had a car or two cars on his income. I don't know. I wonder how many people here have cars. I wonder how many people said, oh, gee, I have a car that's worth X dollars. How do you even figure it? And I guess you do have to report it, but I would say probably almost nobody does. Nobody even thinks about it. They put this man, they destroyed this man, but they put him in jail again because they didn't want him to testify. They didn't want him to testify. That's why he went to jail. They put him in jail twice. He's 77 years old. Now, normally I'd say that's an old guy, but I don't feel 77. Nobody ever says that about me. I'd like him to say, gee, we have to have a little sorrow for this man because they, don't, they just don't say that about me, but maybe I'm better off that way. I think I'm probably better off that way. But they put him in jail twice. And you have to see what they put him in jail. And he was threatened by the judge. This man was told, you're going to get 15 years in jail if you don't give up Trump. And he was told that. You're going to get 15 years in jail. And he made a plea deal because he didn't the rest of his life. And he was told that viciously. We're living in a, in a fascist state. He was told that viciously. So you can go to jail for four months, five months, or you can get 15 years in jail. So do a plea. Almost who wouldn't do that plea? Everyone does those pleas. It's a horrible thing. There's a whole group of lawyers that fight that. It's so unfair. It's so unfair. But they destroyed his life. So many other things. Uh, you look at Southern District didn't want to bring the case. Nobody wanted to bring the case.
And then you know who didn't want to bring the case most of all is Bragg. Bragg didn't want to bring it. But then he brought it, and they tried to make it a different case. They didn't say legal expense equal legal expense. Again, if I wrote down and paid a lawyer — and by the way, this was a highly qualified lawyer. Now, I'm not allowed to use his name because of the gag order. But, you know, he's a sleazebag. Everybody knows that. It took me a while to find out. But he was effective. He did work. But he wasn't a fixer. He was a lawyer. You know, they like to use the word fixer. He wasn't a fixer. He was a lawyer. At the time, he was a, a fully accredited lawyer. Now, he got into trouble not because of me. He got into trouble because he made outside deals, and he had something to do with taxi cabs and medallions, and he borrowed money. And that's why he went. And then he pled to three, uh, three election violations. And as soon as I saw that, I said, I wonder why he did that. He pled. He took a deal. Now, he took a deal because he wanted to get off. In other words, I'll take a plea deal, and I want to get off. And he wanted to make a deal with the Southern District. And they wrote the worst report I think I've ever seen on any human being, other than the report that was written on James Comey by the Inspector General, a very great Inspector General, actually wrote a report that was so bad. This one was possibly worse. The Southern District, the judge didn't let us use it. He said, it's hearsay. I said, it's not hearsay. Wouldn't let us use it. This is about the man. But he got in trouble for a very simple reason, because he was involved with borrowing a lot of money, and he did something with the banks. I don't know if it's defrauded the banks, but something happened. You guys know what it is. And then in addition to that, he gave up on three things where he wasn't guilty. In fact, they were going to testify in that. The uh, head of the FEC, the Brad Smith, the election expert, number one rated in the country, who was going to testify. He took a plea on three things. He just added them in because that gave him more bargaining power with respect to me. But the three things that he pled on having to do with the election and having to do essentially a little bit with me, uh, they weren't crimes. They weren't crimes. Nor is paying money under an NDA. So we have an NDA, non-disclosure agreement. It's a big deal, a non-disclosure agreement. Totally honorable, totally good, totally accepted. Everybody has them. Every company has non-disclosure agreements. But the press called it slush fund and all sorts of other things. Hush money, hush money. It's not hush money. It's called a non-disclosure agreement. And most of the people in this room have a non-disclosure agreement with their company. It's a disgrace. So it's not hush money. It's a non-disclosure agreement, totally legal, totally common. Everyone has it. And what happened is he signed a non-disclosure agreement with this person, I guess other people, but it's totally honest. You're allowed to make the payment. Could, you don't have to make it. And you can make it any way you want. It's a non-disclosure agreement. And he signed that. And there was nothing wrong with signing it. And this should have been a non-case. And everybody said it was a non-case, including Bragg. Bragg said, until I ran for office. And then they saw the polls. I was leading the Republicans. I was leading the Democrats. I was leading everybody. And all of a sudden, they brought it back. It's a very sad thing that's happening in our country. And it's a, uh, it's a thing that I'm honored in a way. I'm honored. It's not that it's pleasant. It's very bad for family. It's very bad for friends and businesses. But I'm honored to be involved in it because somebody has to do it. And I might as well keep going and be the one. But I'm very honored to be involved because we're fighting for our Constitution. The money that was paid was paid legally. There was nothing illegal. In fact, the lawyer in creating the NDA, because at that time, he was a fully accredited lawyer. He wasn't a fixer. I never thought of him as a fixer. The media called him a fixer, or the prosecutors called him a fixer. He was a, he was a lawyer, and he was fairly good. Later on, I didn't like what he did. I didn't like, for instance, I didn't like that when I became president, he went around and made deals with companies. When I heard that, he was gone. He was gone. And he had payments coming to him. 
And a lot of this involved things that are very simple. There was nothing wrong. These were standard, this was standard stuff. All standard stuff. Everything involved was standard. There was no crime here. In fact, I just watched a couple of the reports. You watched Jonathan Turley, Andy McCarthy, Greg Jarrett. You look at all of these people. Uh, Mark Levin, all very talented people, great people, many more, many more. And they don't know me, essentially. They don't know me. They're legal scholars and experts. But I look at them. I watched uh, Turley this morning saying, there's no crime here. Everybody says there's no crime here, except for this DA that's got the, the city out of control with crime. It's, out of, it's absolutely out of control. So we have an NDA that was signed. We have legal expenses. And here's the thing on legal expenses. Uh, you have 100 where they say they do a charge. I just recorded this out. Falsification of business records in the first degree. It sounds so bad. I said, wow. And even my own lawyers, I, I get very upset with them because they don't say what it is. They say, uh, well, falsification of legal uh, records is only a felony. Well, that's a lot. It's only a, they say, a misdemeanor. But they try and bring it up to a felony if there's two crimes. They have all these different things. The other thing is they miss the statute of limitations by a lot. Because this was very old. They could have brought this seven years ago instead of bringing it right in the middle of the election. So they missed the statute of limitations. They did everything. Now, let me give you the good news. The good news is, last night, we just got a report this morning. In the history of politics, I believe, maybe I'm wrong. Somebody will find that I'm wrong, maybe, but I don't think so. They raised with small money donors, meaning like $21, $42, $53, $38, a record $39 million in a, about a 10 hour period. No, think of that. I like those people. Because so far, I guess it's backfiring. Now, I don't know. I'd rather not have it happen. I don't want to have it backfiring. I don't want to win this thing legitimately, not because they were stupid and did things that they shouldn't be doing. They shouldn't have brought this case. They were saying it this morning. This is a case that should not have been brought. I watched Andy McCarthy say this is a case that should not have been brought. And that was this morning. But they all say that. Every legal scholar has said it. Every legal, and these are great people. They really understand the law. And the other thing, a poll just came out. The first poll, I don't know, maybe others will be bad. But a poll just came out a little while ago. The Daily Mail, does anybody read the Daily Mail? It's very good, they have a good poll. At least I like it today. And the Daily Mail just came out with a poll and it has Trump up six points in the last 12 hours. Six points. Six points since this happened. Who thought this could happen? Because the people of our country know it's a hoax. They know it's a hoax. They get it. You know, they're really smart. And uh, it's really something. So we're going to be appealing this scam. We're going to be appealing it on many different things. He wouldn't allow us to have witnesses. He wouldn't allow us to talk. He wouldn't allow us to do anything. The judge was a tyrant. And you got to see that with Bob Costello, a fine man. I've never seen anything like it. And neither has anybody that was in that courthouse where he demanded that the courthouse be cleared. Now, the good news is most of the people in the courthouse were the media. And anybody that was in the media, if you're fair, you'll say, wow. That was anger. That was crazed. He was crazed. And the reason that Bob Costello acted a little bit upset, which I think he has a right to, was that every question he was being asked was being objected to by the other side and sustained by the judge. Sustained, sustained, sustained. I think he did it many times. I don't know what the number, many times. Even I was sitting there saying, and these were basic questions. And he, I never saw anybody 
treated that way by a judge. And I've been treated very badly by two other judges also, because it's all the same thing. And it all comes out of the White House. Crooked Joe Biden, the worst president in the history of our country. He's the worst president in the history of our country, the most incompetent. He's the dumbest president we've ever had. He's the dumbest president, most incompetent president, and he's the most dishonest president we've ever had. And so many of the, he's a Manchurian candidate. You take a look at the way he treats China, Russia, so many others. You know, I ended the Russian pipeline, it was dead. He comes in and he approves it. And he gets three and a half million, meaning three and a half million is paid to the family, his family, from the mayor of Moscow's wife. And I said, where did that come from? Nobody wants to talk about it. But he's a very big danger to our country. And the only way they think that Former President Donald Trump speaking in New York after right being found guilty uh, almost 24 hours ago. We're going back so we're to Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Horden in New York City and David Gura on the ground at Trump Tower. Anne-Marie, I start with you. A highly political speech, a number of statements made. Very political, and Trump is really echoing what we heard from him yesterday before he left the courthouse when he was convicted guilty of 34 of these crimes, making him first former president to um, be a felon that is going to also be running for the 2024 presidential election. One piece of news is that we heard it from him that he will be a Feeling this. Um, that was expected. His lawyers have said that. But we should note, Ed, he made a number of assertions uh, that were false, talking about that this was all done by the White House, by Biden. Um, he says the government got everything it wanted. He says the issue is not a legal expense. Per the jury, they, they viewed this, that this was a falsification of that expense to impact the election, the falsification of those documents per the 12 jurors. Um, so there's a number of assertions the, the former president made that uh, there does not have evidence um, and are false. He will be, though, using this. And you can see he really wanted to pivot to how much money his campaign was able to bring in, about $35 million following the verdict yesterday. And per the campaign note, they say about 30 percent of those donors were first-time contributors to the platform. So you can get a sense of how Donald Trump is going to campaign into November talking about that he thinks and the assertions he's going to continue to make is that this was political and unjustified. Trump was convicted on state, not federal charges. Important because whatever happened in November, that would mean he could not pardon himself, David. The other piece of news I heard is that he had wanted to testify during that trial and gave reasons why he would not. Uh, uh, he would not. David, your reaction? Yeah, and you'll forgive me, it's getting a bit noisy here as we have protesters and supporters of Donald Trump kind of near me uh, yelling at one another, so forgive me if, if I have any trouble hearing you, Ed. But yes, I mean, I thought that, that line was particularly interesting to me. He said that he would have loved to testify. Of course, Donald Trump did have the opportunity to do that, as any criminal defendant does uh, in a courtroom, and he declined to do that. Um, you know, to echo what Emory was saying just a moment ago, I mean, there were a lot of familiar grievances here. I would call it a director's cut of the complaints that we heard from Donald Trump during the course of the trial. You know, he would go downstairs in the courtroom during the lunch break and he would complain about the judge and the proceedings and his time was limited here in Trump Tower in the atrium of Trump Tower uh, he had as much time as he'd like and he was able to go into this in, in a lot more detail there were some winding discursive moments during which he talked about a friend of his whom he didn't identify who had a run-in with this judge Juan Mershon uh, said that the judge again had a vendetta so there was the same kind of invective and criticism of the judge I thought something else that was fascinating in light of that was Donald Trump saying he is still under this gag order. Uh, that was something I think that was a bit uncertain after the, the verdict was rendered yesterday. He just, he's still under that gag order and really did the same kind of tap dancing and tiptoeing around that. He, he was not shy about criticizing Juan Mershon again, the judge who is going to sentence Donald Trump uh, on the 11th of July, uh, really not holding back as he criticized him and how he ran the courtroom. Um, and I'll say he talked a lot about Michael Cohen. I was particularly interested in this part of the, the comments from the former president as well taking issue with the fact that it's now become common for people to refer to him as Donald Trump's fixer. He said that was a creation of the media. It was not his. He thought of him as a lawyer. Of course, Michael Cohen playing this role like Roy Cohn played 
uh, earlier in history, as somebody who did a lot more than just straight ahead legal 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 work in, in a courtroom. Um, but he was quite critical of Michael Cohen and what he had to say. Um, and as Anne Marie said, I think that the the emphasis that he placed on fundraising, the gratitude that he expressed to people who had given money to his campaign and affiliated groups uh, in the hours since this verdict stands out, that's certainly something that's going to be uh, part and parcel of both Donald Trump's campaign and Joe Biden's campaign going forward uh, as this moves from sort of the legal arena into the political one, Ed. Uh, Anne-Marie, this was highly political in, set in the sense that it has been a long speech, but it opened with sort of broader political issues at the heart of this election. One thing that I want to focus on, he said that there's been a sort of a, a, an uptick or rise in New York City crime. The data doesn't support that, but it is, again, a, a, a core political issue in this election cycle. It is, and yeah, it was an unfounded claim that the data doesn't support, but this is something that we do see show up in polls. So let's By and far and large, the economy still is number one when it comes to this election. You could see that in poll after poll. Americans continue to cite the economy and notably inflation as their number one concern. But you also see an uptick of um, issues like immigration and crime being on top of the agenda. And that's that fear that Trump is trying to tap into, that he does, and he's going to say that the Biden administration has not done enough when it comes to these issues, the economy, immigration, crime. We should also note, Ed, that one thing that Trump said yesterday, and I'm sure he'll reiterate as he's speaking now, and we heard from President Biden, is that really the verdict is going to be delivered by the American people on November 5th. They're using that to campaign. Pain. But that's what makes not just July 11th sentencing of the former president, but the debate that's coming just a few weeks before that at the end of June that CNN will be holding. This is the first time we're going to see these two individuals back on stage together and they can make that pitch to the American people. Because when you look at the polling going into this verdict, it's a mixed bag on whether or not this conviction is going to land as a concern for those people in the middle that both Trump and Biden are trying to get to their side, to go out and vote for them. If this conviction is going to land in terms of whether or not, that would mean they would not vote for former President Donald Trump. Bloomberg's Amory Horden and David Gura, uh, former President Trump, continues to speak. We'll continue to monitor and go back uh, as needed. I want to quickly check in on the markets. There's a lot happening in the world. Technology earnings continue. We had important inflation data that supports the idea that the Fed will have room to cut rates in this calendar year at some point 2024. The S&P 500, the benchmark index in the United States, down half a percentage point at the short end of the curve, US two-year yield uh, dropping three or four basis points, 4.88%. We continue to track Trump Media and Technology Group, the publicly traded uh, parent company of the social media network associated with Donald Trump as somewhat of a proxy for what is happening in real time during this program. That stock down 4.6% in near session lows. As I said, we'll continue to track what is happening in New York City as former President Donald Trump uh, speaks. Uh, let's bring things back to San Francisco. The European Commission's Vice President for Values and Transparency, Vera Urova, is in California and met with the CEOs of X, Meta, YouTube, Google, Netflix, and TikTok to discuss the impact of AI on tech, but also how the media and how to safeguard elections against foreign interference. Uh, you are the Commissioner for Values and Transparency. We're grateful to have you here, uh, Commissioner Urova, but I have to ask for your reaction to what you've just heard from former President Donald Trump, um, his track record in politics, but also association with misinformation, which is what we are here to talk about. Mm. Well, uh, it was fascinating to, to listen to former president, and I can agree with him in one thing, that uh, we have a sunny and beautiful day, also here in San Francisco. Uh, the other things I cannot comment because this is uh, just the justice which is doing the job and we have never comments on individual cases. Uh, on your question, well, uh, uh, I think that uh, when Mr. Trump was the president, we saw a very, uh, very big tendency uh, for uh, 
enabling of disinformation to influence the public opinion. I, I don't want to say that he himself was, was doing it. I don't want to dare, dare to say that. But uh, uh, coming back to, to the years uh, of, of his presidency, we saw that uh, the social media were used for manipulation of the public opinion more than before. We have elections in this country this year. You have elections uh, much sooner in, across the European Union. Um, what was the conclusion you've reached meeting with the heads of those very important technology and social media companies in, in the last 48 hours? It was very interesting to meet all of them. Still today I will meet Mr. Zuckerberg. Uh, uh, well, I shared with them my uh, feedback uh, and information which and what I collected was that feedback? in the member states because I traveled to more than half of the member states uh, alerting the representatives of the states and many others uh, about the need to protect the electoral campaign against manipulation and abuse of technology. So this was my, my message here, that uh, first of all I wanted to alert them to uh, maybe increase the preparedness for, for the elections, but it's still several days only uh, before the elections, maybe uh, to explain why these elections are important. The people of European Union are deciding on who will be among those. 720 members of the parliament uh, who have uh, who will have one of the first tasks to uh, appoint or nominate or endorse yes. the uh, president of the commission and president of the Euro European commission it's the person which has the phone number which Henry Kissinger always wanted to have in in the EU so right. it's inc incredibly important and we don't want uh, Vladimir Putin or some other uh, hostile powers to meddle into these uh, elections. And of course, how to do this meddling uh, better than with or the where? use? So for example, you're going to meet with Mr. Zuckerberg later today. There are 450 million people almost across the EU. And so many of them will use a meta product, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. Um, they have been issuing uh, threat reports. We've covered them on this program. And they argue that the industry's current defenses, particularly in the context of malicious or content or misinformation generated by generative AI, they believe they have the sufficient tools and defenses. Are you convinced of that? Well, uh, they know well that in the EU we have uh, the legally binding set of rules, which is the Digital Services Act, which wants them to do, I am simplifying incredibly, uh, uh, two things. First of all, to guarantee that there is no crime uh, spread and amplified by their networks. Here I speak about hate speech, including anti-Semitism, different kind of hate speeches against minorities, terrorist uh, content, extremist content, and child pornography. The second thing is disinformation. And here uh, we see that especially disinformation in uh, combination with artificial intelligence or produced and amplified by artificial, artificial intelligence is exactly something which can endanger our electoral process. We want the elections to be the competition of real people, real visions and chance for the voters yes. to cast an authentic, not manipulated vote. That's why uh, the platforms who I spoke to yesterday, the CEOs, uh, they explained to me what they have done regarding fact-checking, regarding removals of the illegal content, regarding labeling of AI production. And uh, my message for them was yesterday and also back to Europe to, for many other actors is we have to do all more to protect the electoral process. Uh, Commissioner, you're over. One, one name we haven't discussed yet is Telegram. Uh, it's an interesting platform in, in the sense that you had mentioned Vladimir Putin and Russia. Um, there is a growing concern about the spread of disinformation with Russian origins on that platform. Um, have you any specific findings or actions on how that 
uh, has played a role in, in European affairs and, and the upcoming elections? You have very good information. Telegram is an issue. And uh, Vladimir Putin uh, and other hostile actors are using all the platforms. But Telegram is a special case because uh, 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 this platform is not under the investigation of the European Commission because they announced to us they, that they have only 42 million users. And the benchmark for the European Commission to act is 45 million users. So that's why we are now checking whether the figure is right. And in case uh, of uh, the, uh, uh, in case we discover that this is more than for, uh, 42 million, uh, we will uh, have to look deeply into how Telegram works. Because it's true that even the smaller platforms can do very dangerous job in several member states. And Telegram is especially active in the eastern member states where we have a uh, Russian-speaking minority. Uh, EU Commissioner Vera Yurova, uh, thank you for being generous with your time. Thank you for bearing with us as we carried the, the, the comments from former President Trump you. and your reaction to them. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Bloomberg. An unexpected sign-off from U.S. regulators last week paved the way for another landmark in the cryptocurrency industry, ETFs investing directly in Ether. We have been discussing it endlessly, and we will discuss it some more. Joining us now, Noel Aitchison, author of Crypto is Macro Now, uh, and joins us. Uh, I've asked this question to, to all of our guests of the last 10 days or so. Were you taken by surprise? Totally, Ed. I, come, I called this one wrong, I have to confess. I did not expect this fast a pivot so soon. We knew we'd get the, ET, the e spot ETFs sooner or later, and we just thought it'd be later rather than sooner. Noel, you'd assume that there is demand for such a product uh, and that that demand must be based on something. So, so, so give me that big picture, the importance of a, of a spot ETH ETF. I'm going to push back on that slightly, Ed, and my personal view is that we're not going to get a lot of demand for this product. It's not a good product, bottom line. It's great news for the industry in that it increases awareness and it brings in institutional funds that cannot invest in anything that is not listed on a regulated exchange. But as for is this a good product, it's not going to be distributing staking rewards, which means that anyone investing in this product is foregoing roughly a 4% yield. For many, that's a convenience fee, but for professional investors, that's a heavy hefty cost to have to justify to your clients. Throughout the course of the last week or so, uh, many of our guests have labelled uh, ETH as different things. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but if Bitcoin is digital gold, what is ETH to you? Many things to many people, as all crypto assets are, but to sum it up, ETH is digital oil. And that's another reason why the spot ETF is not a great product. Bitcoin is the store of value. It's many other things as well, but for many, it's a store of value. So it's sort of made to be parked and forgotten about. It's an ideal asset for an ETF, whereas ETH is created to be used. It's created to be used in staking contracts. It's created to be used in DeFi applications. It's not created to be parked and forgotten about. And this is a another of the disadvantages of this particular product. But you did highlight the main big advantage there, and that is in the narrative. That is in getting more people interested in the crypto ecosystem and aware that there are many different narratives in play. It's not just one bucket to put all of the understanding in. Noel, I, I, I appreciate your honesty or admission that, that about being caught by surprise or getting the call on it wrong. But let, let's say it's happening, right? It's happening. Are there any parallels we can we can draw with the process of, of and the play out of, of a spot Bitcoin ETF and the procedure and cadence of what might happen from here? 
That's an excellent question. And truthfully, it is one that we're all asking. No one knows the timing on this. With Bitcoin, it was boom, boom and launch because it was expected. It was flagged. We were all ready for it. Whereas Eve caught everyone off guard. And I do think it actually also caught the SEC off guard. And they're still scrambling to approve the S1s. We don't know when that's going to be. Many are saying, your analysts are saying, and they do have an inside information, inside insight into that. Uh, they're saying that it could be during the summer. Hopefully, hopefully it could be pushed back, though, if the SEC wants to stonewall this. But then again, if I were them, I just want to get this out there. Let's move on. Noel Aitchison, author of Crypto is Macro Now. Uh, great to have you back on the program. OK, Bloomberg Technology audience, let's end the week with the check in on the markets. There was a lot happening throughout the week. Earnings continues to be a factor, economic data. The, the kind of summary is that inflation is easing off and that has kind of reignited the belief that there is some room at some point by the end of the year for the Fed to cut rates. In what increment? We do not know. The S&P 500 uh, down six tenths of one percent. We are seeing a sort of rally in the bond market and bonds are set for their best month in the year um, as inflation's fading, right? But what happened with former President Donald Trump is still a factor. Trump Media and Technology Group is the parent or holding company of the true social, uh, social media app. It is down more than 6% near session lows. It had fallen much more significantly on Thursday night after the guilty, guilty verdict uh, for former President Donald Trump. And we carried uh, his speech earlier in this program. Uh, that does it at this point uh, and this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Uh, as I said, recap. What was discussed, the reaction to and analysis of former President Trump's comments on the podcast. You know where to find it. Apple, Spotify, iHeart and Bloomberg. From San Francisco, uh, it's been a week uh, and there's so much more to come in the world of technology. This is Bloomberg Technology.